Hey everybody, we're going to be starting in just a few minutes. We're going to give you a few more minutes to uh, uh, to join us. We expect a couple more people to come, and um, don't go away. Why don't you go ahead and turn off your email, uh, fire up your phone or your Twitter application so you can be sharing some of the fantastic stuff we're going to be sharing with you. Uh, your social network will appreciate it, and uh, we'll talk to you in about 45 seconds. You put me in there. Hey folks, are you ready to get started? Listen, I'm not a big judge of uh, character, but I do know this. You don't want just anybody babysitting your kids at night. You don't want anyone cutting your hair. You don't want just anyone taking out your appendix. And you certainly don't want just anyone testing your website and finding more revenue. The good news is I'm about to introduce you to the guy that you do want working on your website. He's got the trustworthiness of a babysitter, he's got the artistic eye of a stylist, and he's got the skills and experience and rigor of a surgeon. He's been working on websites for 15 years, and before joining Conversion Sciences as managing partner, he built the video production uh, team, 75 people strong for Invodo. He's worked with numerous IR500 brands, and he's invigorated the online businesses um, of, of our clients businesses of all sizes and in all industries. He's tested thousands of hypotheses and most notably recently a lot of mobile device hypotheses. We're figuring out how the mobile web is working. We're beginning to understand what it's going to look like in the next few years. If Mobile Geddon, mobile Geddon Google's Mobile Geddon was a bit of a letdown, rest assured Judgment Day is coming because your customers, your mobile visitors are going to judge you. So. What I'm going to do is introduce you to Jill Harvey. He's going to take you through some of the things that he's been learning through the tests that we've been doing here at Conversion Sciences about what the mobile web is going to look like. You can begin to take these as new hypotheses in your business so that your mobile devices and your mobile traffic is converting at higher and higher levels. I'm Brian Massey. I'm founder of Conversion Sciences. We also have a special offer here today. So Joel's going to tell you the details about that, but stay tuned. Turn off the email. Don't do a lot of multitasking, but be ready to share some of the things that he's going to be sharing with you because your audience is going to appreciate it. And having said that, I'm going to turn it over to Joel Harvey. Wow, thanks for the uh, rousing introduction. I feel like we should have some pyrotechnics or at least some 
fireworks sound effects there for that. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, those didn't, uh, those didn't go off? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, well, next time, right? All right, anyway, thanks, Brian. I am Joel Harvey, a managing partner and conversion scientist here at Conversion Sciences. And as you may have guessed, we are here to talk about everything that we have learned so far about how to win on mobile. So mobile is the top of your mind if you're listening to this if you're listening to this webcast, I'm assuming. So we have run hundreds, if not thousands, of tests, certainly tested thousands of mobile hypotheses over the last couple of years. And we learned a lot. There's still a lot that we don't know. But we're going to share some of the key things that we've learned along the way with you today and show you what you need to be focusing on to start driving wins in your mobile channel. Before we do that, a little bit about us. So Conversion Sciences is what we describe as a turnkey testing company. That means we do everything from analytics and tools set up, conversion audits, and most importantly, everything that it takes to execute an ongoing testing program. Optimization is all we do. We run well over a thousand tests per year. We work with e-commerce and lead generation sites, and we've been optimizing small, medium, and large business websites since 2006. If you want to learn more about the company and our process, you can visit us at conversionsciences.com. All right, let's start. Before we do that, though, as Brian teased, we've mm -hmm. got a contest. A contest. Three lucky winners will be selected, and it could be you. And what will you win? You'll win a site evaluation from either Brian or Joel. The conversion scientists. That's right. Yep. So as all you have to do to be considered for this is tweet your questions to at conversion sci, at conversion sci using the hashtag lab coat lessons. Lab coat lessons. So while I'm going through this deck, um, Brian will be monitoring that stream and we'll pick some of the most interesting questions. We'll talk about them when we're done, and then three lucky winners will be selected for a free site review. So uh, I guess depending on the quality of our presentation here, we'll either have some submissions or we won't. So <laughs> please tweet away. Don't leave uh, us hanging, guys. Yeah, don't leave us hanging. We need questions. We love good questions. All right, so I know you can't see me, uh, but you could see Brian. We're both wearing lab coats here, and probably the question is why. So the science of the lab coat. Why am I wearing a lab coat right now while I'm doing a webinar where you can't really see me? Well, it's actually less about how I look to you than what the lab coat does for my brain. True fact, there we go, proof. By wearing a lab coat, my ability to focus is actually going to double. This has been scientifically proven. More importantly for me, I'm going to make half as many cognitive errors as if I wasn't wearing a lab coat. That's also important for me because I tend to make a lot of cognitive errors and if I can do anything, especially something really simple like just putting on a piece of clothing and cut those in half, I'm happy. I win. Hey, there we go. You can see me right now. I really am wearing a lab coat. Fantastic. It's called enclosed cognition, by the way. That's the science name. Right? See, I couldn't, I wouldn't even understand what you were saying if I wasn't wearing this lab coat, but I do now. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's keep going. So what are we here to talk about today? So far, the worst part of this presentation is your expectations, right? So are we here to talk about mobile optimization best practices? No, because they don't really exist yet. So you see this cartoon here. This is our best practiclops. We created the best practiclops to remind us how dangerous the word best practice is, how dangerous best practices are. And we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, before we really dive into the meat of this discussion. Before we go any further, I'm just betting that several of you have bosses that said, you know what, yeah, you can go to this webinar, you can take the time, but I'm really going to need you to bring some of those mobile best practices back if you want to spend the time. For those of you who are sitting in a room alone or with some of your colleagues, feel free to nod knowingly at this. For those of you who are actually sitting next to that boss, don't nod. No nodding. Um, just keep it inside. So let's talk about what a best practice is, all right? Best practice means commercial or professional procedures that are accepted or prescribed as being the most effective. What does that really mean? Something that works everywhere all of the time. That's what we think best practices are. Now let's juxtapose that with the definition of conversion optimization. The process of generating and using data to improve a site's unique experience for key segments. In other words, 
Conversion optimization is finding the unique things on your unique site that drive your unique visitors to do more of what you want them to do. So juxtapose that with the definition of best practice, something that works everywhere all the time, and you can see that these two things really don't line up. They don't live together nicely. Okay, what's this? Um, for any of you who just instinctively said, oh my god, that's the tattoo in the small of my back, good for you. Um, you win an honorary mention today. For everybody else, this is, of course, the infinity symbol. What is the infinity symbol doing in this presentation? Well, the infinity symbol really represents the fact that there are almost an infinite number of things that you can consider for testing on a website. Clearly, many of them aren't really worth testing, but you have to consider, just in the mobile world alone, what kind of device type you're talking about. What's the operating system? Is it Android? Is it iOS? Is it Windows? What browser are they using? What's the screen size? What do we think the load time is of the page? Is this a new visitor versus a return visitor? Is this a regular desktop site being shown on the mobile device? Is this a responsive site adjusting itself to the mobile device? Is it a mobile dedicated site? What promotion brought them here? What's the site speed? What's the speed of their network connection? Are they in landscape or horizontal mode? Those are just a few of the things that you have to consider. Not to mention the most important things like what's my offer, what is the content, what is the copy, what is the design and layout. So whenever you consider that, we go back to the infinity symbol and instead of starting to look like some romantic physics symbol, it really starts to look something more like this. It's a little bit scary because you don't really know where to start, right? And so this is one of the things that leads to this misconception of best practices, right? Whenever you're faced with this infinity monster, this nasty, terrible thing, mm -hmm. what do you do? Yes, Bri uh, it's no, okay, no, no, it's no, okay, no, Mark. No, it's sorry, okay. sorry. Um, well, you immediately reach for something easy, right? You look for a unicorn riding a rainbow, and then you get on and ride it, and you say, oh, wait, best practices. That's going to make this easy. We don't have to worry about the infinity monster anymore. We've got something in the bag. Well, the truth is that 50% of your ideas, at best, are going to be wrong. And I can say this from years of experience. So part of our process is, of course, painstakingly going through the data and, and the site for any of our customers and coming up with a list of hypotheses. And we have a fairly sophisticated uh, methodology for going through and ranking those hypotheses based on what we think uh, have the best chance of winning. So on our best day, half of those hypotheses don't result in a lift in conversion. And that's not because they're ill-conceived or they're just filler and fluff that we throw into the list. It's because our visitors are very different from us and we really don't understand them. So if you take that and apply it to the concept of best practices, particularly mobile best practices, you're faced with a 50% success rate at best if you just start rolling things onto your site. So we're going to show you some things that have worked for us. If you want to, you can just go start rolling stuff out onto your site. I would highly encourage you to test it because what works on one site in the same industry doesn't work on another site in that same industry. And this is where we get the best practiclops. And all of a sudden you say, hey, we tried some things that those experts said worked, and it didn't work for us, and therefore, you know, optimization doesn't work. We should focus on something else. So don't be that company. So whenever we think about mobile websites, and this is really true of all websites, but we find particularly true of mobile websites, this is really the case, what you see on the screen right now. So this is based on, we've all, we're all familiar with the concept of desire lines, right? Universities, state capitals, and other places, uh, landscape engineers go to great pains to lay out what they think are the best routes for sidewalks, right? And what you find inevitably is that the visitors, the users of those sidewalks, pick their own path. And we believe, in fact, we know for a fact that this is absolutely true in mobile. The problem is on mobile, it's harder for a visitor to cut their own desire line, right? We have a specific design that doesn't allow them to do that. But this is your mobile site right now. There is what you think your mobile visitors want, and there's what they actually want. And I guarantee you, they're two distinctly different things. 
So part of the exercise is understanding what they actually want and reconciling that with what you thought they wanted on your site. We're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to do a quick overview of the mobile marketplace. I'm going to tease the punchline here. Mobile traffic is growing. You already knew that. Um, then we're going to dismiss the mobile overview because you already know it. And we're going to get down into the heart of what we're going to talk about, which is how do you understand your mobile visitors? And then how do you use that understanding to start testing things that have a high probability of working? Okay, mobile market overplay. O mobile, mobile, see, that's my first cognitive error. I would have had at least two if I wasn't there wearing this last yes. coat. Countless awesome. others if, if you Count. haven't been wearing the coat. Whoa, hey, <laughs> just one other. All right, mobile marketplace overview. Okay, so this is the number of global users in the millions. And you can see that in 2014, mobile overtook desktop. No big surprise there. This graph is actually really interesting. I like this one a lot. So this is from Monetate, and it shows conversion rates by device type. So this is certainly skewed to an e-commerce environment. And you can see that conversion rates on, sorry about that, on smartphones and iPhones and Android phones, this is the light green bar, um, are much, much lower than desktop. iPad's a little bit higher. Um, but particularly iPhone and Android are low. You can see that the add to cart rates are about half that of, say, desktop and tablet. But the conversion rates are um, less than a third. So this tells us what we probably all already know, right? So some of you are probably saying, hey, mobile visitors are always going to convert at a lower rate than desktop visitors. And to a certain extent, that's probably true. However, the key thing here is what are we trying to convert the visitors to do? And the interesting thing is mobile visitors are not necessarily always going to convert lower than desktop visitors. In fact, there are some goals where they convert much higher, say, for example, phone calls. The question is, are you trying to get your mobile visitors to convert on the right goals, on the right things? That's actually the key question, because this is a false statement. Mobile visitors won't always convert at a lower rate than desktop visitors. But if you're trying to get them to do the exact same thing that you want your desktop visitors to do, then depending on your industry, it may very well be true, but you don't want to be locked into this because this is a bad place to be. We know that that, we know that, that is going to be a continuously growing percentage of your traffic. Here's the truth. Your optimized mobile experience is going to be different from everybody else's. Just like on desktop, probably even more so. It's going to be different from everybody else's. How do you find out what it's supposed to be? Well, you do that through analysis and testing, of course. The data will tell you. Here's just an example of how, how mobile growth is, is different across industries as well. So this is a, gra a graph that shows mobile growth, growth for a website that caters to high school students. And not surprisingly, the growth has just been rapid. These are heavy mobile users. They prefer mobile over anything else. Here's an example of a luxury e-commerce site. And you can see in just 12 months, the percentage of people visiting the site on mobile has grown from 20 up to 35 percent. And this has real life implications on your site-wide conversion rate, on how many things you're actually selling and moving because in, a, in an environment like this one in particular, most people don't buy on mobile. So you have an ever-increasing percentage of your traffic coming in on a device that so far doesn't produce revenue. What do you do about that? Here's the growth in an addiction treatment site. Now, on an addiction treatment site, these are usually older visitors. They're less likely to visit on mobile. So the percentage of mobile has relayed, re remained roughly the same here. Who knows what your graph looks like? It's going to be different for everybody. OK, so that's the mobile marketplace overview. Now, let's forget about that, because it's really a bunch of stuff that you probably already knew. You certainly are on this webcast, because you know that your mobile traffic is growing, and it's important. And that's really all that matters, right? How do you understand your mobile websites? That is not a typo. Websites. You don't have a mobile website. You have mobile websites. In fact, you don't have one mobile website at all. You probably have 18. You probably have 27. Who knows? There's a combination, and we can see all these things in our analytics package, of device, browser, 
operating system, and screen size. Those four things, all of those together, there are probably several meaningful different combinations of those things that will tell you how many mobile websites you have. And this is important because even with just, just for example, in the iPhone alone, this graph shows how many different screen sizes you could be dealing with. It doesn't even get into the different versions of iOS or network speed or any of those other things, just different screen resolution sizes. And you can see there are a bunch. And in particular, the iPhone 6 and the iPhone 6 Plus have proved very challenging. And they've launched after a lot of responsive sites went live. And we see them sub-optimizing, even breaking some responsive sites that were built before those came out. So you need to understand how many different mobile websites you have, how many different combinations of those mobile indicators you have. And then you need to be able to see your website through those. Here's another question. Landscape versus horizontal. I'm curious how many people listening today have an understanding of the percentage of their visitors that land on their site in landscape mode. Or, you know, even easier, how many of them how many of you have an understanding of how many people go from horizontal to landscape during their visit? This is a key indicator that, you know, if someone comes in horizontal mode and flips to landscape, it's an indicator that they need something different, perhaps, right? Maybe they can't read your content as easily on horizontal. Maybe because uh, the column is too narrow, the text is too small. Who knows? This is something that's really interesting, and we find that a lot of people are flying blind on it. Anytime we do a mobile test, we actually have this as a goal. We've written some very simple JavaScript, and if you like, um, you know, tweet us. We'd be happy to share the JavaScript. You have to use a testing tool like Visual Website Optimizer, Optimizer, or something else, set up a custom conversion goal, and use this JavaScript, and you can actually track how many people are switching from landscape to horizontal or landing in one versus the other. It's an interesting piece of insight, and we find that a lot of people don't know it. But the reality is this, whenever you take into account all of the things, device, operating system, browser, screen resolution, landscape versus horizontal, even connection speed of the visitor, one of your sites is broken. We don't know which one, but we have a way to find out, and you need to have a, a way to find out. So this is a really ugly picture of part of what we call our QAtion station. Another word for it is a usability lab. So Whenever we're working on a website, we want to make sure that we can see all of the different websites as the visitors do. And this becomes incredibly important, especially for mobile, because you need to be able to kind of turn from landscape to horizontal and see if some of your calls to action break, see what happens. So you don't have to have a usability lab like ours in order to do this. I would imagine that between everybody on your team, you could cobble together a mobile usability lab from everybody's phones. And then you can supplement that with things like cross-browser testing or, or other emulation services to give you a sense of where your site might be falling down. We almost always find either something sub-optimized or absolutely utterly broken whenever we take site through the usability lab during our conversion audit phase. And I would venture to guess that you will too. And that's okay. It's better to find it than to not know it exists. Here is another thing that you absolutely have to do on mobile. Take your mobile site, take your mobile phone, I mean, pull up your site, turn off Wi-Fi. If you want to see how your website works for a large swath of your visitors, you need to look at it the way they're looking at it. Right? So this, is, this goes beyond just looking at it on all the different devices and screen resolutions that you have. This goes straight down to how are they accessing your site. Right, we sit in our office and we have super fast Wi-Fi and we connect our mobile devices to that Wi-Fi and then we look at our site and we go, wow, this thing loads fast, this is great. Our responsive site is making decisions in, in lightning speed time, this is fantastic. See what happens when you switch to a 4G connection. And in fact, one of the most valuable tools you can have is actually a mobile hotspot with a 3G or 4G connection because you should do the same thing on your desktop site. Right, just understand how your site is working for all of your meaningful visitor segments and understand what those segments really are. Okay, let's talk about optimizing your mobile websites. This is really what you're here to, to talk about. So we're going to talk about 
a few concepts. First, mobile is screen one. For almost all of you, mobile is the highest probability type of device that people will have the first interaction with you on. And it's important to understand that. <laughs> Sorry, Brian looked at me and it, 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 I made another cognitive error. Um, I'm, a, I'm a kind of a cognitive error machine, really. Man, and that's a beautiful thing. It keeps us all on top of our games. All right, it, it, we're laughing here. Um, then we're going to talk about either dedicated mobile websites or heavily QA responsive websites. We're going to explore the different experiences for iOS and Android. This is fascinating, by the way. And then we're going to talk about what you need to test first, or really where the wins are. Okay, so mobile is the first impression. There's not a lot to say here, other than whenever someone, say someone's decided they're going to buy a new TV. What do they do? They pick up their mobile device whenever they're stopped at a traffic light, whenever they're, you know, sorry for this, but sitting on the toilet, <laughs> whenever they're sitting at a restaurant waiting for their friend to join, and they start doing some simple searches. You know, best LCD TV over 52 inches. Right, they're trying to get a, a sense of what their consideration set is. And the consideration set is comprised of you know, all the different specs and brands that you want to consider for the television. And then it moves into, all right, I've discovered what the one or two things that I want to buy are. Now I need to figure out who I want to buy them from. And research of those, you know, the research that creates those two consideration sets doesn't happen in mutually exclusive websites either, by the way. Right, so they might be doing these exploratory searches, best LCD TV over 52 inches, and they don't just land on like consumer reports websites. They land on real merchants. They're going to land on Best Buy. They're going to land on Fry's. They're going to land on other sites. They're not landing to buy right then. They're landing to understand what they want and who might be able to provide it for them. And this happens across any number of industries, whether it's e-commerce or lead gen, in the beginning, when people are in tire kicking mode, at the very top of the funnel, they're using their mobile device to figure out what they want and who might be able to provide it for them. So the key really becomes making sure that you are positioned to make a great first impression and putting yourself in a position to be the, the website that they come back to whenever they're actually ready to make a decision about who to buy from or who to submit their information to. Pretty simple concept, probably not surprising. But if you forget that, what are you going to do? You're going to start making your mobile be exactly like your desktop, and you're going to lose when you do that. All right, now let's talk about one of my favorite topics, responsive. So remember the best practiclops? This is where the best practiclops lives on mobile. Responsive design. I'm, I wish we had a poll here for all the, the visitors, Brian, because I would love to find out how many people have gone responsive in the last year and how many of them actually kind of really moved very quickly, quicker than you would like them to, to get their sites responsive in response to Google's you know, mobile, mobile Geddon. It's right? a lot. It's a lot, especially with mobile Geddon driving it because Google's recommending. I certainly know we were taking phone call after phone call after phone call saying, hey, we've got to go responsive. Um, because of Google, and can you know? Can you help us do that in like six weeks? <laughs> um, here's the truth about responsive, right? Responsive templates make decisions for you, and unfortunately, those decisions are not always good. So, I mean, think about this: you have very unsophisticated technology saying, trying to say in real time, okay, this this device is this screen size. I need to move this here. I need to eliminate this. I need to change the order of these things. It's not artificial intelligence here, okay? It's really dumb technology making decisions about how to fit stuff from a screen, you know, that's 17 or 15 inches down to a screen that's three or four inches. What could go wrong? What could I mean, go wrong? It's, it's surely you're guaranteed absolute success. And especially with people that have done that in the last year, many of them hurried it along and, you know, said, hey, we're responsive done deal, we're good to go. Well, that's really just not the way it always works. Let me show you some examples here. So this is an example of a site we worked on. This is a screenshot from the desktop, okay? And this headline right here is something that we tested to, and we found in this case, for desktop visitors, it actually increased phone calls by 57%. Wow. So this is a good thing. 
this is a, a, a fundamental game changer for the business, really. Um, any business that can have a single sentence that increases your, your primary conversion goal by 57% is, is a good thing. Now, this was a few years ago. Um, this site was actually an early adopter for mobile, and they had an early responsive site. Here it is. Well, what's missing from this responsive site? The responsive site made a decision that was not a good decision. Right? This was missing. And this was easy. We could see this on the mobile. We said, hmm, what should we test on mobile here? Mm -hmm. Maybe we should test what worked somewhere else here. Um, and we told the responsive design, don't make that decision. You're bad. You're bad. You made a stupid decision. Go sit in the corner. 26% um, increase just by telling the responsive design not to do what it was doing. Um, this, is, this is real. This happens. We see this happening even today. So let's flip the coin, though. So here is a different site, same industry, obviously, but a uh, different site. So the, the purpose of this page is people come to this page, and they're looking for an alcohol abuse treatment program in Florida. And so theoretically, what you want people to do on the site is come down here, and hopefully you can see this. This is names of different, different cities in Florida, right? So you want them to drill down to the city they're interested in. So this is essentially what this page would look on look like on desktop. This is the top. This is kind of in the middle where these 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 city listings are. This is essentially what this page looks like looked like on a mobile device. Um, Wait, so let me get the. Uh, so Brian, where can you glass. find? Yeah, can you find uh, Naples, Florida, in this in this uh, list? I live in. Is it? It's on the list. It's all over the list. It's the whole <laughs> list. Just click on everything. So you know, we looked at this and said, this is actually a good candidate to. You know, improve the mobile experience here and make it more responsive. And so we did a test to fake responsiveness. We took this and essentially made it like this for mobile visitors. This is great. Can you see, you know, can you find your city now? I can. I yes, can. you can. This is a better experience, right? Calabasas, here I come. Absolutely, except for the fact that this improved experience reduced conversions by 19%. So if you just go responsive and do what you think is a better experience for your visitors, what happens? Well, maybe you'll win, maybe you won't. But so in this case, if this wouldn't have been tested, if they if the customer would have just said, you know what, let's drop a hundred grand and redesign this site so that it's totally responsive, let's do it the way we think the visitors are gonna love, the end result would have been a 19% drop in conversion rate at least. So not really the desired outcome unless you're trying to make less money, which I doubt. Here's another example. I love this one. So this is a pay-per-click landing page for Banfield Pet Hospital. Uh, you know, they've got hundreds, maybe even thousands of locations across uh, across the country. So this is their they're spending pay-per-click money to get people to this page. This is their desktop landing page, and here's the mobile landing page. So what's missing? Well, I'd say the most important thing to start with on the page, the logo, your initial credibility and trust builder, is gone. So we have a responsive template that made a decision to simply remove the company's logo. And the headline is very true in this case. We have not been properly introduced because we haven't been introduced at all because yeah. there's, no, there's no brand. And I think let's fix that is very apt here as That's well. That's right, and, and we did. <laughs> okay, so... Just a, just a couple of other examples. So here's here's a here's a product page on an iPhone 5. You can see that it's kind of wrapping the text around, and there's 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 no there's no bumper here. iPhone 6, actually, all this text comes up because the screen's a little bit bigger. And here's what it looks like on an iPad. So here's the other thing: you've got this responsive design that is doing all these different things on all these different screens. And what you really need to do is say, hey, this is the way we intended it for it to look. So we need to make sure it looks like this on all of our screen sizes. Like you, most people don't even know that this is happening because they just look on one device and say, yeah, this, is, this looks good. Here's one of the worst things. So Internet Retailer did a study and found that for large e-commerce sites that were responsive, the average load time just for the home page, just for the home page, we're not talking about like a category page with like, you know, 50 different product images on it, just the home page, was 18.24 seconds. Oof. 
That is, what, about 16 seconds too long, probably, especially for mobile visitors. Here's the thing. So we're all really impatient. All of your visitors are impatient. Uh, we're getting more and more impatient. And mobile visitors make desktop visitors look like the Dalai Lama when it comes to patience. And so if you're talking about something that results in an 18-second load time, you're really shooting yourself not just in the foot but in both feet and both knees, and you're lucky if it stops there. Oh, and P.S. Responsive really means you're, re you're redesigning your entire site. You don't get to, get to make the mobile site responsive, but the desktop site remains the same. So right now, the desktop site is probably your bread and butter for most of the people listening to this. You have to redesign that to have a responsive site. And here's what we know about redesigns. Mm -hmm. They almost always result in a decrease in conversion rate. Sorry, it's just a fact of the game. So here's what we're talking about. We need to go responsive because somebody said we needed to go responsive. And we're going to do that, and then we're going to redesign our desktop site, which is our bread and butter. And the most likely outcome is that conversion will go down on our desktop site, and our mobile site will be sub-optimized for many of the different uh, device, browser, OS, screen size combination segments that come to it. That sounds not so great. Okay, so here's a true story. We have been in the trenches on mobile for quite some time, and you know it's 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 been very rewarding. We've sat, we found a lot of wins, but it's sometimes baffling, and it's always very difficult. Um, so, true story. This is actually what my hair looked like before we ever started doing any any responsive responsive testing. I remember um, that. I remember yeah, that. everybody does. It was my signature. I remember that that. That example we showed just a few minutes ago where the responsive design was actually eliminating the most important conversion element on the page. As soon as we discovered that, like I woke up the next morning and this is this is what what I had. Um, you looked good in a mullet. It was baffling. I, I went to several different specialists, nobody could explain it. Um, and this is essentially what I what I look like now, and you can see there's an evolution. I certainly don't have that that Fabio thing going anymore. Um, we've run some projections. This is what we're good at, projecting things. And we're projecting that if, if things don't start making more sense in the mobile world, um, within we don't have a perfect projection, but we think it's between 9 and 11 and a half months. This is what I'm going to look like. And Brian's laughing. This is real. Like, this is my life. Um, and in about 24 months or two years, Tragic. this is... This is where the projections go. I'm still just a young tragic. I'm still a young man. I just take I take what we do so seriously and I want I want to win for our customers. And so we find, you know, we find that all this stuff that doesn't make sense and it's oh, it's it just you can see what it's doing to me. Um, all right, well let's move on here. So iOS versus Android, right? A mobile a mobile visitor is a mobile visitor, right? It doesn't matter what operating system they're on, surely. That couldn't if make only a difference. if only. Well, the truth is, you know, Take your pick. If you're an Android user and you like dogs, then Androids are dogs and, and, and iOS are cats. Vice versa, it doesn't really matter. They are not the same thing. That's, that's what we know. They are not the same thing. So this just shows some examples here. Um, so this is a real test. Uh, basically, you can see we we're testing uh, headers on the same site here. And this is actually a rare example, this one on your left, of... Android and iPhone both being positive, but you can see that Android, we got a 78% increase in leads with this header versus just a 25% increase with iPhone. What you normally see is something like this. Android plus 3%, iPhone minus 21%. Like this is real. There's this is this is no joke. So this is a, an e-commerce jewelry provider testing menus. This menu is preferred by Android users. This was preferred by iOS users. You know, meaningful, statistically significant differences. Just a few examples. Here's another example of a header. You see almost exact opposite performance here. In this case, iOS users hated it. Android users loved it. This is fixing a shopping cart with uh, abysmal conversion rates on mobile, as we would expect, but still. We did some testing, and we found that iOS users were fairly keen on it. Android users hated it. 
fixing an e-commerce category page or testing on it rather same thing iOS users responded very positive to uh, positively to uh, this experience whereas Android users couldn't stand it and you can see that all of these were negative for Android all of them positive or more or less neutral for iOS we could we could do an entire webinar it might be the most boring webinar ever but we could do it or we could go through hundreds of examples like this so the takeaway here is whenever you're testing always segment your mobile you have to you should segment your test at least you know desktop mobile and if you've got enough traffic you can segment them you know new versus return obviously for different traffic sources all of these things but whenever you're testing on mobile you have to segment iOS versus Android because if you don't what happens very often the positive from one will be wiped out from the negative from the other and you won't really see what's happening now the implicate implication for this is you also have to be set up with your testing tool to essentially do personalization and any testing tool will do this you know from from optimize the visual website optimizer test and target monetate simply say you know continue showing this to this segment it's uh, testing testing 10 not maybe 101 but like 102 okay you have to do this if you haven't been doing this with your mobile traffic you're leaving a lot of money on the table all right now down to the best part what are some of the things you can do right now to start driving higher conversions? And in other words, what are some of the, you know, what we've tested, the hypotheses we've tested, and the things that we've won on across dozens and dozens and dozens of mobile websites? Some of them are very sp site specific, like the offer language and the copy. And you know, that, that's the kind of thing that usually yields the biggest results in any business. And there's no kind of rule of thumb that we can share here. But there are some, some layout things and some execution things that we have found with the right words and the right elements on them work across almost all sites. These are sticky headers, what we call persistent calls to action or parachutes, utilizing your footer, and then optimizing for the right goals for your mobile audience. So let's talk about headers, sticky headers. And for anybody that doesn't know, what we mean by a sticky header, so this is your header. And what we, what we mean by sticky is making this persistent, locking this on the screen as people scroll so that it's always in their view. So this is back to our example. We work on many other sites, but this is just one that we've you know, watched the evolution of. So just making the existing header sticky, we saw a 9% increase in conversion. In this case, conversion was phone calls. But we've seen this across e-commerce. Uh, form fill legion and, for, and phone calls and so we started to say okay well what else can we do here so we added a simple call to action we saw a really big increase in phone calls just by adding some language with essentially an offer over time this has continued to evolve you can see here we've got a redesign where to utilize space we've combined the logo and the menu hamburger we've tried different calls to action now we've got this little search box here as well this did okay but redesign it with this thing that reinforces what our primary goal is, a phone in this case, we saw a 22% increase. So this works across a lot of websites. Another note here, if you're interested in phone calls, make sure that your tell links are working right. This is obviously a really old example because this stuff doesn't, oops, sorry about that, this stuff doesn't look the same anymore. Um, but Safari doesn't necessarily do a fantastic job of identifying phone numbers and auto writing tell links. So anywhere where you have a phone number on your site and you want someone to be able to do click to call, make sure you've explicitly written the tell link around that phone number. Um, in this case, we found this site didn't have click to call, and we were able to we were able to test that by adding it, and we literally saw a 20% increase just in click to call, and it makes sense. Right, you're on your mobile device, you don't have to put it down and write the number down and then type it in. So There are phones built into these mobile devices, aren't there? They, they really are. They're mobile and they have phones. Perfect. Crazy. So let's talk a little bit about persistent calls to action or parachutes. So what I mean by this is something usually at the footer. It's very similar to a sticky header. And by the way, we found that very often sticky headers with these parachutes or sticky, like bottom stickies, work great together. You know, originally we said, oh, you can't, that's too much. Like it's too much to keep in front of the, the, the visitor. But what we've essentially found is in most cases you can have both and they're very complementary to one another. Obviously, you have to test your way. We recommend testing to the, the right header first 
and then switching to the this persistent CTA or the parachute as we call it. So why do we call it a parachute? Well, we call it a parachute because we know that mobile visitors will scroll much farther down a page and much faster than desktop visitors. So mobile visitors, this is an interesting fact, are more likely to see all of the content on your page than a desktop visitor, especially if you have a lot of content and it's a long page. You can see this in your own in your own in your own screen screenshots like from Crazy Egg and stuff that, that so or the scroll maps is the word I was looking for. Sorry. You can see this in your own scroll maps. You can see this in session recordings. The problem is they do it fast and they sometimes get lost. And they say, oh my gosh, where do I go now? So having a parachute, some place for them to parachute out of this purgatory they've gotten themselves into is absolutely critical. So it has to be trimmed, it has to be you know, optimized to the right offer. But we find that, say for example this, we got a 45% increase in product page visits whenever we added this, we got the color right, and we got the offer language right. Use the footer. So this really, really dovetails in with what we were just saying about how far a mobile visitor will scroll. So mobile visitors are much more likely to see the footer of your site. And for most of us, the footer of the site is this just graveyard of crap that we throw into the bottom. It's like a privacy policy and some, you know, some maybe some legalese. Just a bunch of crap that's not really um, going to compel anybody to take action. And so someone scrolled to the bottom of your page, and what are you telling them? Copyright 2015. Oh, yeah. Ooh, yeah. Privacy policy. Yeah. Whatever else you're telling them, it's not, <laughs> it's not really the last thing you want to you say to close the deal. About us. About us. Better Business Bureau. <laughs> Whatever. So go back to this example here. So this is the footer, and we saw in scroll maps that about 50% of mobile visitors reach the bottom of pages here. And so, you know, we're like, you're here. Desktop version, copyright, you know, the same thing. Why not do something a little bit more compelling? So we changed this to be, you know, basically a reiteration of kind of the value proposition, why someone should call, how we can help. We saw about an 8% increase in conversion. We'll take that. We'll take 8%. You know, anybody that would, so mobile, you know, mobile is probably between 40 and 60% of anybody's traffic at this point in time. We see some outliers, but more or less, that's the range. So, you know, let's just say it's 50%. An 8% increase on mobile is a 4% increase on your entire business. There's not many things that you can do to magically get a 4% increase for your entire business. This is an example of one of those things you can do. It's the beauty of conversion optimization. Obviously, you guys are listening and you know that. It's a huge lever to grow your business. So anyway, use the footer. The footer is no longer a graveyard. Use it. Reiterate your offer. Reiterate your value proposition. Get people to take action once they get to the bottom of that page. All right, I want to talk about alternative mobile goals. So we kind of hinted earlier in the, in the webcast that, you know, Conversion for your mobile visitors may very well look different than conversion for your desktop visitors. And one of the ways to really leverage the growth in mobile is to understand and accept that. So I want to use an example here. So this is a, a design tool to design like vinyl banners, signs, things like this. It's a phenomenal tool, great site. This is the desktop version. This is the mobile version. And you can see this is a flash-based tool that doesn't work on iOS or Android devices. Not only that, even if it did work, you're not going to design a banner or a sign on your mobile device. It's just not the way to do it. And so essentially, we had this mobile dead end and you know a substantial portion of mobile traffic that simply just was not converting. So we said, what should we do about this? Well, let's shift our focus. Instead of saying, you know, we need to get more conversions and more immediate revenue out of mobile visitors, we said, let's just focus on getting their email address. We can see from a lot of the upstream indicators that these people are really just kicking tires. Remember, they're creating a consideration set. Well, let's do something to remain in their consideration set. Okay? So how do we do that? Let's capture their email. So you can see we basically say, hey, you don't want to use your mobile device to, des to design this sign. Give us your name and your email address, and we'll email you a link to this page. You can come back to it later on your desktop whenever you're ready to do the design. We had a 5.3% form completion right here. 
Not bad, especially for the out of the gate experience. The person who completed this form received an email with a link to that page, and the link was specially coded so we could track it and track those visitors. And what we found was we got a 26% email click through rate here. Now, this didn't really result in an immediate boost in revenue from those click throughs in email, but what it did is it actually lit a fire in terms of the email list growth rate, right? So we were started to basically add about almost 1,400 new email addresses each month through this experience. And this is a business, like many of your businesses, that ultimately, I wouldn't say live and die by their email list, but it's pretty darn close. The beauty of the email list is you can control your own destiny and your marginal cost of delivery is almost zero. For not just for every single recipient of your email, but for every email. It's so cheap and it's how you stay in, it's how you create and satisfy repeat customers, which is the, the lifeblood of any business. So back to this. Almost 1,400 new email addresses each month. Now we know the value of every recipient, right? So um, we're fond of a metric whenever we're evaluating email called revenue per recipient. You can go back historically and look at the trend. What is our revenue per recipient? And we know that the annual revenue per recipient in this case is 11 bucks. So 1,300 new email addresses, or 1,400, in this case is worth almost $200,000. So you take, you take this and you say, all right, originally we thought we needed people to design stuff on a mobile device, which is not going to happen. So instead of trying to get them to convert and turn into immediate dollars, let's take a long-term play or a medium-term play, get their email address, and over time we know that that's going to actually start creating a lot of revenue from this mobile channel that we're getting none from now. This is kind of an extreme example, but we use it to illuminate the fact that you really have to take a hard look at what your mobile visitors will be willing to convert on for you. Right? So this doesn't mean if you're an e-commerce site that you don't let people put stuff in their cart and you don't try to optimize the checkout process. But what you should focus on is whenever someone puts something in their cart, have a call to action that says email me a link to my cart. Whenever somebody's on a product page, have something that comes that, 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 that provides them an easy way to have a link to, of that page emailed to them. These are just small examples, right? The email is probably the most obvious one, but there are many other things you can do. So at the end of the day, this doesn't have to be your mobile site. You can align what you think your mobile visitors want with what they actually want. And some of the strategies that we talked about today are how you're going to do that. All right, so just a reminder, what you need to do right now. Optimize your header and determine if a sticky or non-sticky header works better. Start testing those persistent calls to action, those parachutes. So test placement, test color, test language, and test the page you're sending them to. Take a hard look at the footer content on your mobile device right now and ask yourself, if this is the last thing that someone sees on this page, am I doing a good job to compel them to take action? If the answer is no, the next question is, well, what could we do here to compel them to take action? And then last and foremost, really, is ask yourself, are we optimizing for the right goals on mobile? Do we really believe that you know, doing X, and X is what we want people to do on our desktop site, is the best use of our optimization efforts on mobile? And test some alternative goals. All right, once again, um, we do have the opportunity to win a free site evaluation from either Brian or myself. Um, I'm not sure, Brian, have we been getting some questions here? We've been getting some, not that many though. So uh, if you were to submit a question now, you would there would be a good chance that you would be a winner. So hit us now with your questions. We've got a few more minutes to answer those questions and we've got, we've got one or two already in the mix. All right, so either we've already answered all the questions and that's why you're not sending them, or this presentation was so terrible, you're thinking, why would I ask these guys a question, particularly <laughs> that guy that's been talking most of the time because he doesn't know what he's talking about. I just want to remind you, we are wearing lab coats, so any questions you ask us, you can absolutely take the answer to the bank. Um, <laughs> we need some questions, folks. Well, you know, and I, 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 
I think one of the things that I experience whenever I'm sitting here listening is mobile testing sounds really complex. So we talk about um, all the things that we could test, that we can't really rely on a responsive uh, design to deliver our mobile test, that the calls to action are different, that we've got to consider whether or not they're iOS or Android, uh, and we've got to test on that we have 15, 18, 20, 30 different websites, depending on the devices people are coming on. So given all of this kind of terrifying ways of slicing things, what do you recommend? Where do we start? What's a, Where can we kind of get our first set of wins from if we haven't quite got the sophistication to do all the testing that we do here at the, at the lab? Well, first of all, I'm not going to do a, a site review for you. Okay, so we're eliminating your question. <laughs> My question from doesn't qualify? The consideration set, yeah. Um, so what can you do? So yeah, I agree. Like This makes it look complicated because there are a lot of moving parts. But the reality is this is no more complicated than any other kind of testing. I don't know what kind of testing you can do that you don't have to take all these things into consideration. Right? So I think to simplify it, you know, we back up and say, here's the areas I want you to focus on for your site. The header. Do you have do you have the header nailed right? And this the header needs to include your logo, possibly your menu, maybe not if you're talking about a pay per click landing page or something like that. It needs to include some kind of some kind of call to action or some kind of value proposition language, depending on if you're you know if you're a lead gen or say e-commerce or something like that. And it may need to include something else, something secondary. Like on an e-commerce site, I think a search badge. On a lead gen site, I think a you know that phone badge that we showed. Mm -hmm. Get get that right. Find out if it should be sticky and persistent or not. Start with your header. That's simple. That's one of the most important things on a mobile site. Start there. This the examples of the little persistent CTAs on the bottom of the screen. Those are simple. You don't even have you don't have the designer to do those. It's just a rectangle with some kind of color filled in and some language overlaid that when people click it, it goes to another page. That's actually really simple. And we've seen that work literally on every single site we've tested these two things on. We've seen really big gains. That's why we chose these examples, because these are about as close to generic as it gets. Right? So these are really as close to mobile best practices as it can get. Do these things. It's going to look different for all of you. But if you do these things and focus in these areas, these are some, if you're not already doing them, these are some really easy early wins you can get on your mobile traffic. And the other thing is segment, when you're doing your testing, segment via iOS and Android. That's really simple. Um, so I don't think it has to, it, it shouldn't come across as being super complicated. These are some, at least some simple things you can start with. I guess the question is, well, what if we're not set up to do any of this testing, period? Well, I mean, that's that's a whole other issue. That's that's an entirely different issue because then you're in the boat of trying to decide what you're going to put on your site without having to test it. And that's, frankly, that's not something that we would ever recommend. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if you have to do that because that's just the boat that you're in, you don't have enough traffic or transactions to test, I would still say focus on these areas. Um, and I guess you just have to do the best that you can there. But you know, put it on there and see if it makes a difference. Do pre, you know, simple pre-post data analysis. Yeah. Yep. But as long as you're going back and looking at the data and seeing what happens, then you are using data to drive your decisions. We did have a question from Alex on Twitter, and he was talking about um, what if we have landing pages that are mobile friendly, but our website is not. So if, say we're driving pay-per-click traffic from an ad to a landing. Page. It's mobile friendly, mm -hmm. but then our website is not. Is this? Um, is this? Uh, do you recommend this? Can we test on mobile? Uh, I'm sorry, on landing pages before we go and start staging things. Absolutely. I mean, and, and, and specific landing pages in a way are a little bit more simple to test on than site wide because you're only testing on one page. So, I mean, honestly, if you're just going to start anywhere, you should start where you're spending money on those visitors, right? So your pay per click landing pages. It might get a little bit tricky if you have crossover from that landing page to the main site, which you probably have some, but not a lot. Um, I think, I mean, I think it's, I think it's perfectly fine. In a perfect world, both your landing pages and your main site are mobile friendly. Um, but frankly, if you can have just one or the other, start with your pay-per-click, pay-per-click landing pages. That's 
that's where you're spending money to get eyeballs. You might as well Why optimize not? that first. Why not? One real, one more real quick one. Um, so let's say we don't have a, a big conversion lab like we've got here at the lab. Um, someone on the call doesn't have that. What are the what are the browsers that we generally see the most trouble with? Are there some some primarily difficult browsers or devices that at the very least we should go and check on those? You know, if, if that if that question pertain to desktop, then the answer is you know, usually it's Internet Explorer that's going to cause you problems. But, you know, in mobile, we're really not talking much about Internet Explorer. I mean, that's, you know, Windows devices, and that's usually less than, really less than 3 to 5 percent of your total mobile traffic. So I don't know that it's really browser-driven as much as it is you know, screen size and operating system-driven. Um, so, you know, often our developers work in iOS first, right? That's what they use. And so often in the QA process, if we're going to find breaks, it's probably going to be on Android, and then we obviously have to go back and fix those. Uh, the place where we, you know, the, the thing that really trips you up, and we had a couple of examples in here, but not that many, just the different screen sizes. And this has been an issue with Android for a few years, right? Because they're really the first ones to come out with, you know, Samsung was the first to come out with like the phablet, which is essentially what the iPhone 6 Plus is now. And all those different screen sizes are really, they really wreak havoc on responsive designs. Um, and like, as, like I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of responsive sites that were designed pre-iPhone 6. And so really, you know, for most people, the least common denominator is iOS, and that's kind of what they were designed to. And so they were designed either on iPhone 4s or iPhone 5s, and now iPhone 6 and 6 Plus comes along um, and is kind of actually, those, those screen sizes are almost uh, like deserts or, or you know, neverland for, for these responsive sites. They don't really know how to respond to them. So those are the two places where we see the most issues on, on mobile. And the fact is, you know, browser, Android users are almost always going to exclusively be Chrome, and iOS users are going to almost always exclusively be Safari. Okay, okay. So, Luis, why don't you put us back up, put my camera back up on screen. We'll say goodbye to the crowd. Uh, definitely uh, a rousing golf clap for Joel. And um, thank everybody for joining us. Um, that's the end of our webinar. So, you'll find the replay uh, at our blog, www.conversionscientist.com. Uh, if you found this helpful, please share it with some of your colleagues. They will thank you for it. Um, and there's a lot more content going up every week on The Conversion Scientist. We've got a new um, podcast going up today, a new column over on Marketing Land that's talking about how to set goals in these testing tools. So I um, hope that you will um, join us in these other places. And uh, thank you very much for being here today. Thank you very much.